Hey guys, Mr. Smith here. Coming at you from uh, this is my ComTech audio production storage room. Uh, it is where it is a quiet space I found in my school where I could shoot a video. So here I am. And uh, today we're starting our sixth unit on exponential functions and logarithmic functions. Um, right now, uh, you guys. Uh, haven't been introduced to logarithmic functions. You have been introduced to exponential functions. And in this lesson, we're going to review some uh, properties of exponential functions. Uh, we're going to discover some new ones. And then we're going to explore what the inverse of an exponential function uh, looks like. Uh, to start off, a very simple exercise that we're going to do. Um, we're going to look at some tiling patterns. Uh, predict the later terms, look at the finite differences, and just review some ideas from earlier grades, kind of building up to exponential functions. So in this pattern, we can see that the, the first, second, and third kind of term in this pattern each have two, four, and six squares, respectively. So what I'd like you guys to do, you can pause the video. It's not a real big brain buster, but can you pr predict the number of squares for the fourth, fifth, and sixth term in that pattern, and then calculate the finite differences. So pause the video and unpause when you're ready. Um, of course, it's not too hard to see that the pattern in the blocks was adding two, adding a new, basically a new row each time. So eight, 10, and 12. And if we look at the finite differences, We can see that the first differences, I might call them delta y1, the first differences, are just increasing by two every time. And we can see, hey, that the first differences are equal. And we know from our grade nine course, that means that this uh, is uh, this pattern represents a linear function. So let's add a few notes here. Black for my typing. First differences are equal, so this is a linear function. And uh, we could also state the equation for this linear function. I'll write that in. So here, the number of squares, t, is uh, dependent on the term number in this way. It's just twice the term number. And we can see that's a linear equation. Um, we can see the first difference is equal. Um, nothing surprising here. And so this is essentially our um, uh, what you guys kind of investigated in your grade 9 course. And then in your grade 10 course, you might have looked at some growth patterns like this one. And again, we can see the first three terms of the pattern. One, two, three, one, four, nine. Same deal. Can you guys pause the video? What's the fourth, fifth, and sixth term? But then you can you calculate the finite differences? What does that imply about what type of function this would model? And can you come up with an equation for that function as well? So I will assume you've paused and unpaused and you're ready to go here. Of course, this pattern is just we're making squares of side lengths of n. And so we would have 16, 25, and 36. If we calculate the finite differences, so the first differences, I'll call them delta y1, we're going up 3, and then 5, and then 7, then 9, and 11. And in grade 10, this is like, oh, this is the big discovery. They're not, they're not, the first differences aren't equal. In fact, it's the second differences, delta y2, that are equal. And in your grade 10 course, you guys said, oh, that means that this is a uh, quadratic function since the second differences are equal. And we can actually state the equation for this guy too. I'll just write it in. And 
In this case, the number of squares, t, is given by the square of the term number. So the equation is quadratic too. And of course, now in this course, we saw that for uh, cubic functions, the third difference is equal. For quartic, the fourth difference is equal, et cetera, et cetera. In your grade 11 course, you would have looked at the what happens when a relationship is exponential. So in this one, we have the first three terms, two squares, four squares, eight squares. And again, you can pause the video and unpause uh, when you're ready. Um, but here the pattern is that we're doubling the number of squares each time, 16, 32, 64. And when you calculate the finite differences, so when you calculate the first differences, delta y1, you get 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And so in your um, grade 11 course, you would have said, okay, well, it's, this isn't a linear function. You would have done the second differences to check if it's quadratic, delta y2. And you get 2, 4, 8, 16. And the second differences are, equal, are not equal. And then you could even try calculating the, the third differences, delta y3, and you just keep getting 2, 4, 8, 16, et cetera, et cetera. So this is neither linear or quadratic. It's something different. And this simple scenario represents exponential growth. This table of values represents an exponential function. And the reason it's exponential from the first differences is that if you look at the ratio of consecutive differences, the ratio of consecutive differences are equal. And uh, the equation of this exponential function, exponential, is, we'll get that down in a second, but what, what we mean by ratio of consecutive differences, so if you look at any of these first, second, third differences, the ratio of consecutive terms, whether it's 16 over 8, or 32 over 16, or 8 over 4, the ratio is always the same. It's 2. And it's the same for the first differences, the second, the third. It'd be true for the 10th and 20th and 50th differences. You always get the ratio of consecutive differences being equal. And that ratio corresponds to the base of the exponential function. Here, the number of squares is just simply powers of 2, 2 to the power of n, an exponential function. And you guys learned about exponential functions in your grade 11 course. <clears throat> so first, um, uh, kind of review property, the ratio in an exponential function, the ratio of consecutive differences are equal. Um, so just to summarize what you guys know about exponential functions. So for this, that first guy we saw with the tiles, the graph of 2 to the power n, or any gra the graph of any function f of x equals b to the power of x, the graph is increasing. if b is greater than 1. If b is greater than 1. So for example, our tiling pattern would be an increasing exponential function. Other examples, 3 to the power of x, an increasing exponential function. Or something like, even like 1.01 .01 to the power of x would be an increasing exponential function too. As long as the base is bigger than 1, it's increasing. What does the function look like? And again, you guys would have developed this in your course last year. The function looks like so. Has a y-intercept at 0, 1. And the, it goes down to a horizontal asymptote as x approaches negative infinity. 
Um, as x approaches pause infinity, the graph shoots up the y values approach pause of infinity. Uh, but yeah, a rough sketch of an increasing exponential function when uh, the base is bigger than 1. I just noticed let's just say uh, is increasing. And then we'll parallel this for when it's decreasing. The graph of an exponential function, uh, you can also have exponential decay. So you can have a graph that's decreasing if b is between 0 and 1. So if b is between 0 and 1, so examples of that, something like y equals 0 0.5 to the power x, or y equals, say, 2 thirds to the power of x, or y equals 0 0.99 to the power of x. As long as the base is between 0 and 1, you'd have a decreasing exponential function. And what that looks like, be consistent here and use this guy. Does that look like a lot like an increasing exponential function? You go through the same y-intercept. Um, abroad first. Same y-intercept of 0, 1. And you have a horizontal asymptote. In this case, when it's a decreasing exponential function, as x approaches infinity, in the positive sense, the y values approach 0. But as x approaches negative infinity, the graph shoots up towards y equals infinity. These are what the graphs look like. This is the difference between an increasing base bigger than 1 exponential function and a decreasing base between 0 and 1 exponential function. All, No matter what, though, whether the base is above 1 or below 1, some of these properties are the same. All of these functions, b to the power of x, will have the same y-intercept. 0, 1, which makes sense because uh, some base to the power of 0 is always going to be 1, right? Anything to the power of 0 except 0 is 1. These guys all have an asymptote of x equal or of y equals 0, a horizontal asymptote that is approached one way. They each have the same domain. X can be any real number. And what you guys investigated in your grade 11 course is not only can you put in integers in zero and negative numbers, but you can put in rational exponents too. So the domain x can be any real number. And the range of our exponential functions, each of these is y is any real number such that y is greater than zero. These graphs hit all the y values, but never touch zero. Uh, so this is just a small review exercise. Let's take some data and let's fit this data with a, an equation, an exponential equation. Now, you could probably guess we're doing a note on exponential functions, probably going to be an exponential equation, but like, let's say if you had some data and you didn't know. Well, as we talked about in our, uh, our first exercise, if you look at the finite differences, and here we get 3, 12, 48, and look at the, we know it's, so we know it's not linear because the first differences are equal. And then you look at the second differences, and you get 9 and then 36. Okay, the second differences are not uh, equal as well. But if you look at the ratio of the differences, and we can do that for the first because we have a couple of ratios there, we see that 48 over 12 is the same as 12 over 3. It's 4. This is consistent with the second differences. 36 over 9 is equal to 4. So we know this is an exponential function because the ratio of consecutive differences is the same. So I'll add a little blurb about that. This table represents an exponential function. I've got an n in there. I always forget an n. Uh, since the ratio of finite differences ratio of consecutive differences Um, not only is it the same, it's 4. Now, it is actually true that whatever that ratio is, 
that's the base. Your exponential function here is going to be 4 to the power of x. But let's say you're unsure about that. All you knew was that it was exponential. You know that the function looks like y equals some base to the power of x. And we actually know it's increasing, so the base is bigger than 1. What you could do is you could plug in a point. So for example, we could plug in the point uh, 1, 4. 4 equals b to the power of 1. And to solve for b, and you just get b equals 4. Yeah, so you could just, we verified it, the equation of this function, y equals 4 to the power of x. Now we know it satisfies one point. We could, we could check to see that it satisfies others. And um, I just, since I have the space, might as well. Uh, when x equals 0, y equals 4 to the power of 0, which is equal to 1. That checks out with the table. When x is equal to 2, y is equal to 4 squared, which is equal to 16. That checks out with the table. So we can be reasonably sure we have it. So again, keep that in mind, guys. When you are finding the finite differences, that, that ratio of consecutive differences you get is actually the base. However, you can also find the base by setting up the equation and plugging in a point. All right. So a little review, a little crash course on some properties we know about exponential functions. Uh, let's look at a new property. And we're going to investigate um, uh, how the instantaneous rate of change uh, changes on an exponential function. So we're going to look closely at 2 to the power of x. So for an increasing exponential function, it's fairly obvious that if you looked at the slopes of the tangent lines, they keep increasing and increasing, right? As you go along the curve, the slopes are increasing, but they get they get more and more steep, more and more positive. So we can be relatively sure that the instantaneous rates of change as you increase the x values is going to increase as well. But how do they increase? Is there a connection? We're going to make that connection now. And so what I've got for you guys is I have seven points. I have seven points on the function 2 to the power of x. And I've got uh, seven other points that are very, very close to those points. Um, and they're also on 2 to the power of x. I had to round the decimals a little bit, but I rounded to five decimal places on this handout. So they're pretty close. And what I did was I found the next point that was 0 0.01 units to the right. So I added 0 0.01, plugged that in and got the new point. Just I figured I'd save you guys some work. We're going to find the instantaneous rate of change, but we're going to um, we're going to be smart about it. And we're going to use Desmos to get do some of the work for us. And I, I you might have seen me close a window. Uh, clo you might have seen me close a window there. I actually had this all set up in Desmos ready to go, but I want to show you guys how you can uh, use Desmos or other programs to kind of like do the work for you. So we are doing f of x equals 2 to the power of x. So there's the graph there. Nothing surprising, increase in ex increasing exponential function. I'm going to add a um, table in here. And we're going to do a table. Our x values are going to run from negative 3 to 3, like on our sheet. Just 1, 2, 3. And the, uh, in this column here, we'll plot the y values. So f at x1. Make sure you put x1 so it gives you the y values uh, that you've you, that in your first column there. And we can see it's plotted those points for us. Looks like we did fine. But I, I also want to add a second set of points. So in this a third column here, I'm going to put in x1 plus 0 0.01. And that gives us the x values that are um, um, the x values that are uh, in our table, right? Negative 2.99, negative 1.99, et cetera, et cetera. And then I want to plot those points on the exponential function. So I'm going to and we're, we don't want to graph those guys. Uh, and we're going to graph f at x1 plus 0 
And you can see that added those points to our graph. And it's got those same Y values that I have on the lesson sheet. The one thing now we're going to make Desmos do for us is we're going to get Desmos to calculate the instantaneous rate of change for us. Uh, so I'm just going to um, just make a little diagram over here. So say we had two points, say we had the point A and F at A, and we had the point B, F at B. Uh, remember to find the average rate of change, we just find the slope between these two points, right? F at B minus F at A over B minus A. To find the instantaneous rate of change, one of our strategies was pick, if we want to find the instantaneous rate of change at negative 3, 0 0.125, we pick a point very, very, very close to it and find that average rate of change, find the slope, and that will give us a good estimate of the instantaneous rate of change. So we're going to get Desmos to calculate the slope between those two points and put them in our table. So here, uh, and that'll give us a good estimate of the instantaneous rate of change. Um, so we'll go to this next column over here. And in this column, so I'm going to put a bracket because we're going to calculate some stuff on top. So we're going to do F at B minus F at A. So that would be F at X1. Plus 0 0.01 minus f at x1. So that's our y values, and I'll close that bracket off. On the bottom, we're doing the difference between our two points. And in our case, the difference between our two points, x1 plus 0 0.01 and x1, is just 0 0.01. And we've got Desmos to do, so I'll just kind of flip back through it there. So we've got f at x1 plus 0 0.1. So the y value is the, the, the second y value minus f at x1, the first y value, all divided by 0 0.01. So this now has given us all of those instantaneous rates of change, or at least pretty close to it. So we've made Desmos do the work for us. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So let's um, copy those down into our table. I'm going to pause the video while I do that, and I'll check in with you guys in a second. All right, and we're back, guys. So I just transferred those. I ran into three decimal places, but I transferred those rates of change into our lesson sheet. And I've also graphed them on the grid below. And then we see something really cool. If you graph, and just do your best job, if you graph those instantaneous rates of change, what you get is those instantaneous rates of change also appear to form an exponential function, which is really cool. This can be seen in Desmos. If you click on our points for our instantaneous rate of change column, you can see that, yeah, it's it's exponential too, which is really, really, really interesting. The last thing we're going to do is there's actually a connection between the rates of change and the X value of the function. So in our final column here, we're going to go one more column over. We're just going to do a ratio. Oh, I wonder if I can do, um, can I call that Y2? You know what? I think, yeah, I think we can copy and paste, which will work. Yeah. So in this uh, final column, we're going to take the instantaneous rate of change, and we're going to divide it by the Y values. So we're going to divide 0 0.087 by 0 0.125. We're going to divide 0 0.174 by 0 0.25, and so on and so on. And we're going to see what we get. We can make Desmos do this for us. If I copy all that stuff there and then put uh, divided by F at X1. Check this out. This is really cool. You actually get the same value about 0 0.696. Now, it's probably not too onerous for us to check that by hand with our calculators, but you can verify it for yourselves, even with the ones we did with some rounding there that those ratios are the same. The instantaneous rate of change divided by the X value of the point of tangency 
gives you the same value. So 0 0.087 divided by 0 0.125, 0 0.696. Point one seven four divided by point two five zero point six nine six, and hopefully you're convinced. Zero point six nine six, all the way down. That's really interesting. So this is a property of exponential functions that maybe you didn't talk about in your grade eleven course. And the the the, the idea is this: instantaneous rates of change. are increasing. So not only is the function increasing, the y value is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go on, but the slopes of the tangents, the instantaneous rates of change are also increasing and they're actually proportional function. So another way of saying that is that the instantaneous rates of change are proportional to the function itself. And, or in other words, the instantaneous rates of change are equal to some constant times the value of the function. And in this particular one, the instantaneous rates of change for two to the power of x, for y equals two to the power of x, the instantaneous rates of change were 0 0.696 times the value of the function. So very cool. You guys take that another step further in your calculus course when you guys start, start talking about the derivative of a function. So this is going to set you guys up well for that. Now we're going to repeat this process just one more time. Uh, but luckily, we Desmos has now been pre-programmed and has everything we need. We're going to repeat this process for 0 0.5 to the power of x. So that was for an increase in exponential function. What do we see when we do a decreasing exponential function? Do the rates of change increase like so? Does, this, does the same proportionality um, thing happen? Uh, well, let's investigate. And all we have to do in Desmos is change our function from 2 to the power of x to 0 0.5 to the power of x. And so you can see Desmos has updated the function, made the new graph. Um, we have the, um, the x values plus 0.1, the new values of the function, the instantaneous rates of change, and the uh, ratio uh, of the, uh, the ratio of the instantaneous rate of change to the function. And we can see uh, that they're equal as well. So let's take a moment and let's transfer all this data to our lesson sheet. And I'll check back in with you guys in a second. All right, guys, and we're back. And uh, yeah, so the really interesting thing is that the instantaneous rates of change here, we can see they're negative, which makes sense because it's a decreasing exponential function, but they form an exponential function too. Uh, it's just an exponential function that has been reflected in the x-axis. And that ratio of the rate of change to the original function is also the same for any x value. So that's really, really, really cool. So heading back to our lesson sheet, I've uh, transferred those values. The instantaneous rate of change, you get negative 0.691. And I plotted those on our graph. And now we'll just make some similar notes as to what we had on the uh, previous slide. Uh, that the instantaneous rate of change, in this case, they are decreasing. Um, well, they're, they're also increasing. Uh, they're, they're getting less steep, but they are going from a big negative to a small negative. So they are increasing in value. Um, and are proportional to the function. And just like last time, it's the same connection here, except for the, in this case, so for y equals the function 0 0.5 to the power of x, the instantaneous rates of change, as we saw, were equal to 0 0.691 uh, times the value of the function. 
and sorry, the negative 0 0.691. Okay, so this is the on top of reviewing some of the properties of exponential functions you guys have learned already. This is a new one. The rates of change are um, also exponential. They're also constantly increasing, and they're proportional to the value of the function. This is an idea you'll explore more in your calculus course. The last thing, the last new thing we want to explore with exponential functions is uh, their inverse. Now in your grade 11 course, you learn about the inverse of a function and that it's a transformation that swaps the x and the y values. So for example, the inverse of our basic linear function, y equals x. So the inverse is just you switch the x and the y. So the inverse is x equals y, which if you rearrange it, just gives you again y equals x. And the inverse, the notation that we use for inverse, is the inverse f to the power of negative or f with a superscript negative one so in this case the for the linear function y equals x the it, the inverse of that function is itself the inverse of the function um, y equals x squared is x equals y squared now you guys can actually isolate the y for that being careful, you get y is equal to, uh, well, that's, you get y is equal to plus or negative the square root of x. And, you know, the, um, this is a very, very rough diagram here. y equals x squared is the basic parabola. And x equals y squared is like basically a, si a sideways parabola, just like this, which is a, a combination of the radical function and a reflection of the radical function. So here, um, the, uh, and so for C, uh, we have y equals x cubed. And so the inverse would be the flip of that, x equals y cubed. And um, rearrange, and, and isolating that for, uh, for x, you just get the cubed root of x. And just drawing a simple function, of, a simple diagram of that, here's our cubic function. So we know already what that looks like. The graph of the cube root function looks something like this. Um, and one thing to note is that, and so I'll write down here, f inverse of x is equal to the third root of x. Um, the inverse of the quadratic function, x equals y squared, is actually not a function because it doesn't pass a vertical line test. However, the inverses of y equals x and y equals x cubed uh, are functions because they do pass a vertical line test. Uh, you can also, and this is what you learned in your, your grade 11 course, you can also think of in, uh, inverses as a reflection in the line uh, y equals x. That's what happens when you switch your x and y value. So what we want to look at is, well, what's the inverse of an exponential function? We're going to sketch a couple of functions, a couple that we've already looked at. So two to the power of x, what does that look like? Goes through zero, one, one, two. Let's just plot as many points as we can on our graph here in three, eight. I can also plot negative 1.5 and negative two, uh, 0 0.25. I can do that, you know, relatively accurately. So that, that's fine there. I'll include those guys. Let's sketch the inverse. So when I'm sketching the inverse, I like to kind of just like dash in the line y equals x. Just as that nice visual representation. And to graph the inverse, all we have to do is swap the x and y values. 0, 1 becomes 1, 0. 1, 2 becomes 2, 1. 2, 4 becomes 4, 2. Um, 3, 8 becomes 8, 3. And there was a couple more. Negative 1, 0 0.5 goes to 0 0.5, negative 1. And negative 2.25 goes to 0.25, negative 2. And check this out. Here is the graph of the inverse. It passes the vertical line test. The inverse of um, 2 to the power of x is also a function. 
And let's talk, about, let's talk about some of the properties of this of this function. So for 2 to the power of x, the domain of that function is x can be any real number. And the range is y can be any real number such that y is greater than 0. What about the inverse, though? The inverse doesn't hit all the y values. The inverse actually kind of levels off. It has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. The inverse has the following domain x can be any real number such that x is greater than zero and the domain is y can be any real number the domain and range kind of flip-flopped which is really interesting but also kind of makes sense because that's what inverses are it's swapping the x and y um, the um, uh, the function two to the power of x is increasing um, the inverse is also increasing over time the y-intercept of the um, uh, function 2 to the power of x was 0, 1. The inverse does not have, um, does not have uh, a y-intercept. Uh, it has an x-intercept. Maybe uh, might be even worthwhile to, might be even worthwhile, let's just say an a, but then just say the x-int is uh, 1, 0. So that point zero, 1 that was a y-intercept is now an x-intercept of the inverse. And we had, a, we had a horizontal asymptote for the exponential function at y equals 0. And when you swap the x and y's, this gives a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 for the inverse. And what we see is, well, clearly like the inverse is a function but what is the equation of this inverse like what equation would give that graph that's kind of like what we're where we're going at next let's do this also just for a decreasing exponential and then we'll be finished guys so negative one half to the power of x goes through negative three eight negative two four negative one two zero one one a one half and two 0.25. That'll be plenty of points to get the idea. Let's graph that function. Something like so. I'm going to graph the line y equals x. And let's graph the inverse by swapping the points. So negative 3 8 goes to 8 negative 3, negative 2, 4 goes to 4, negative 2, negative 1, 2, 2, negative 1, 0, 1 goes to 1, 0, 1. 1.5 goes to 0. 0.51, and 2.25 goes to 2, uh, 0. 0.252. And so we get the inverse, whoops, didn't quite work out the way I wanted. Looking something like so. Yeah, that's not too bad. A reflection in the line y equals x. Let's talk domain and range and then wrap this up. What's the domain and range of 1 half to the power of x? Well, domain, x can be any real number. In the range, y can be any real number such that y is greater than 0, much like for all exponential functions of the form b to the power of x anyway. The inverse didn't hit all the x values. It's stuck at the positive x values, x greater than 0. The, the range is that y values can be any real number. The inverse function touches all the y values, whereas the uh, 1 half of the power of x was decreasing. So is this inverse, both decreasing. What's the y-intercept? The y-intercept of 1 half of the power of x is 0, 1. And uh, that goes to just like before, the inverse has none, but it does have an accent is one zero. One half to the power of x had a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero, and that switched to a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. But again, the question is, you know, What's the, what is the inverse? What is the, what is the equation of this inverse? 
Now we know what the equation is if we just swap the letters. It's x equals 2 to the power of y. And this would be x equals 1 half to the power of y. But how can you get the y by itself and get an actual expression, a function, um, for the inverse? That's what we're going to be looking at in our next lesson. So uh, to summarize the things we've done, so we've talked about the proper, some old properties of exponential functions. We talked about the finite differences having a repeating pattern. That ratio of consecutive differences is the same. And we reviewed um, the graphs of increasing and decreasing exponentials and talked about their four properties. That's so always the same. Domain, range, always the same. X can be any real number. Y is greater than zero. Y intercept was always zero, one. And they have a, uh, uh, they have a, y, a horizontal asymptote at Y equals zero. Um, but today we also looked at this new stuff that the rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change is uh, proportional to the function, um, uh, which was a really cool idea. And then we looked at the inverse and we uh, have an example of our inverses. We know that their equations, if we just swap the letters is X equals some base to the power of Y. But next lesson, we're going to focus in like, what is an actual equation for that? Um, and it should be fun. So for, uh, for now, I've got some suggested practice for you guys, um, uh, suggested practice. I'll fix that in your lesson sheet. Uh, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed that lesson. I'm um, looking forward to the next one. Take care guys. We'll see you soon.